بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه يجمعين أما بعد In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the one who bestows mercy Indeed all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds and may peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family, companions, and all those who follow the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until yawm al qiyamah. In this lecture, we come to the second lecture in the series regarding sects and groups throughout the history of al Islam. And this lecture has been entitled Wahhabiyyah. Are you regarding the uh, movement or the group which have become to be known as Al Wahhabiya? And this lecture that we're going to go through, it will be divided into various sections. The first section will be an introduction in which we will speak about this term Wahhabiya and where it came from and what it implies. Secondly, whether we can consider Wahhabiyyah to be a sect. And then thirdly, if it is not a sect, then why are we talking about it in this series of lectures, which is regarding groups and sects? Secondly, we're going to talk about the benefits and the fruits and the objectives of studying this particular movement. Thirdly, we're going to speak about the founder of this movement and something from his life and also from a historical aspect how this movement grew and how it reached to where it has reached today fourthly we're going to mention some of the underlying principles of this movement fifth a mention on some a mention of some of the doubts which are spread regarding this movement and an answer to them and then finally, bi'idhnillah, reasons why this movement and this blessed da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimullah, why it was so successful. So with regards to the introduction, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us of the splitting of this ummah. He said, وَسَتَفْتَرِقُ أُمَّتِي إِلَىٰ ثَلَاثٍ وَسَبْعِينَ فِرْقَةٍ My ummah will be divided into 73 sects. Kulluha finnari illa wahida. All of them will be in the fire except one. The companions alayhim ridwanullah, they said, Man hum ya Rasulullah, who is this one saved sect? Al-Firqatun Najiyah, the saved sect. In a narration he said, Al-Jama'ah. In another narration he said, Humma ana alayhi al wa ashabi. They are those people, that group, which follows what I am upon today and what my companions are upon. And the hadith is in the Sunan, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawud and others. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the Ummah, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it will be divided into a large number of sects. All of these sects and groups will be calling to misguidance, apart from the one that calls to the Sunnah and the way of the companions. So the first question which comes to our mind is, is Wahhabiyyah a sect? Because we're studying it in this series of groups and sects. And secondly, is it correct to call this group or this sect or this movement Wahhabiyyah? Is this name and is this term correct? So in order to answer that question, is Wahhabiyyah a sect? We have to understand what is the meaning of firqa? Because in Arabic, Sect, it means firqa. And firqa in the Arabic language is ta'ifatu minan nas, any group of people. If we're speaking linguistically, just the Arabic language, any group of people is called a firqa. But of course, when we're talking about a firqa, we're not talking about the linguistic meaning. We're talking about the technical istilahi meaning. When we say firq, the sects of al Islam. So what is a firqa according to this terminology? A firqa is kullu ta'ifatin minan nas. 
every group of people da'at ila mu'taqadin mu'ayyin and this group of people this group it invites others it calls to a specific set of beliefs bihaythu urifat bihi wa tamayyazat an ghayriha and it calls to these beliefs so much so that these beliefs are exclusive to this group and this group is distinguished by these beliefs and this group is known by these beliefs so a firqa ta'ifatun min an-nas a group of people da'at ila mu'taqadin mu'ayyin and this group of people calls to a particular set of beliefs these beliefs that this group calls to is exclusive to them and because of this exclusivity this group is distinguished from the other groups and it is known by these beliefs so for example the sect the rafida if we were to ask what distinguishes the rafida from the other sects and the groups of the muslims what's the answer naam sab sahaba the fact that they insult and curse the sahaba alayhim ridwanullah also al ghulufi hub al al bayt how extreme they went in their love for al al bayt and the other beliefs which are exclusive to them if we said what is what are the beliefs by which the qadariya are distinguished and known by who knows the qadariya they said naam harun yeah so, naam so, naam exactly with regards to the qadar and opposing to them are the jabariya and they said no every person is forced to do an action he has no free will so the qadariya they negated the will of allah and the jabariya they are known for negating the will and the choice of a person oh the mu'tazila oh the khawarij the point is every one of these sects they have a particular set of beliefs by which they are distinguished and known by exclusive to them away from the other groups as for this movement al wahhabiyah then this isn't the case because the ulama of those who attribute to this group with this name they don't have a set of beliefs which are exclusive to them their aqida is an extension of the aqida of the salaf of this ummah the sahaba and those who came after them and also what is known regarding ahlus sunnah is it isn't permitted for ahlus sunnah to give themselves a name other than muslim or something which relates to the sunnah Al Imam Malik rahimullah he was asked bima yu'rafu ahlus sunnah how are ahlus sunnah known he said alladhina laysa lahum laqab yu'rafuna bihi ahlus sunnah are those people who don't have a particular name by which they are known meaning they are not jahmi neither they are qadari neither they are rafidi they are muslim or any name which calls to the sunnah like ahlus sunnah ahlul athar ahlul hadith the followers of the way of the salaf like this but we don't have a name to a particular person or a particular time or a particular town our name it is derived from islam or sunnah or the way of the salaf or the athar and this word al wahhabiya it was first when it first when it was first used it was utilized for political objectives so when the da'wa of al imam al mujaddid muhammad ibn abdul wahhab rahimullah when he started to grow those who opposed the da'wa to tawhid and those who felt that this movement was a threat to their authority started calling them al wahhabiya or the wahhabis and this was the same in najd and even throughout an najd So for example in India during the era of the British when they when they had colonized India the ahl hadith and even the ulama of Dioband even the ulama of Dioband they were known as wahhabis why were they wahhabis because they are a political threat to the British empire over there so initially it started off as a political name And then after this the various divin sects at that time they also started utilizing it and then it became known as the fifth madhhab 
So you have the four recognized madhabs within Islam. And then you have this group who have brought a new madhab. And this is a madhab called Al-Wahhabiyyah, the Wahhabis. So this was the initial usage of the name Al-Wahhabi. Meaning that this is a madhab which is innovated. This is madhab which is outside the four recognized madhahib of Al-Islam. And what they meant by this is, of course, the followers of at tawheed those who won against shirk, the followers of the sunnah, those who won against bid'ah, the imams of at tawheed those who follow and Imam Ahmed al-Hanbal ibn Taymiyyah and those who came before them, these were the people who they are referring to. And of course, even the usage of the term Wahhabi, it isn't correct. Because the founder of this movement, his name was Muhammad. He was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And Abdul Wahhab was the name of his father. So had the scripture even been correct historically, it should have been Muhammadi. That these people are Muhammadiyun. But they didn't want to use the word Muhammadi. So instead they used the word Wahhab, which was the name of his father, Abdul Wahhab. And even if they do use this name, uh, or of course, after a while, the connotations which were attached to this name in academic circles, this wasn't the case. So now Wahhabi and Wahhabist and Wahhabism, this is used in academic circles, in universities, in the theses, uh, amongst historians, and it doesn't have any bad connotation to it. It only refers to a particular movement in a particular, a particular time of history, the Wahhabi movement or the Wahhabist movement, meaning the movement of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimullah. Some of the uh, academics, they call it the Najdi movement. Some of them call it the Wahhabi movement. This doesn't have any connotation to it. And also we should note that Al-Wahhab is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَاب Very, you are Al-Wahhab. So Al-Wahhab is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this, even if a person does call us Wahhabi, and we don't accept this because Wahhabi is not a sect, and we don't ascribe to any person part from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the ijma' of the Sahaba and the Salaf, but if a person calls you Wahhabi, so what? He's ascribing you to a great Imam of the religion, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimullah, Imam of at tawheed He didn't bring anything new. He followed the Salaf. He followed the Imams who came before him. So what if a person calls you Al-Wahhabi? Rather, you should be proud that you're being ascribed to a great Imam of our religion, as opposed to a Naqshbandi or this or that. And that's how one of the poets, he said, In kana tabi'u ahmadin mutawahhiba, fa'ana al-muqirru bi annani wahhabi. If being a follower of Imam Ahmad, the Imam of Hadith and the Imam of Sunnah, if this is wahhabi, then I'm proud to be a wahhabi. An fi sharika anil ilahi fa laysa li rabbun siwa al-mutafarrid al-wahhabi. I negate any partner from Allah, so I don't have a Lord except al-wahhab. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La qubbatun turja wa la wathanun wa la qabrun lahu sabab min al-asbabi. We don't have any hope in uh, um, a grave or a mausoleum, nor any idol, nor any grave, or anything which has any type of reason. Kalla wa la shajarun wa la hajarun wa la aynun wa la nasabun min al-ansabi. Neither do we place our hopes in a tree or a stone or a person, or any idol. أيضاً ولست معلقاً لتميمة لرجاء نفع أو لدفع بلية. Neither am I a person who wears an amulet. أيضاً ولست معلقاً لتميمة. Neither do I wear a, a amulet, or حلقة, or ودعة, or نابي, or bracelet, or anything similar than this. لرجاء نفع أو لدفع بلية. Allahu yanfa'uni wa yadfa'u ma I don't wear an amulet or a bracelet hoping that it will bring me some goodness or repel some evil. Rather, Allah will benefit me and Allah will repel the evil from me. Arju bi anni la uqirru bihi wa la ardahu deenan wa huwa ghayru sawabi. I hope that I will not accept this religion of ash-shirk and neither will I be pleased with it. 
He said, Umiru bi ayati sifati kama atat bi khilafi kulli mu'awwilin murtabi. I accept the attributes or the ayat of the attributes of Allah as they have came in the apparent meaning, as opposed to every doubter and every person who interprets. Wal istiwa'u fahasbi qudwatan and as for the istiwa of Allah, then enough for me is an example. Maqalu sadatil aqtabi, the statements of the great Imams. كَشَافِعِي وَمَالِكٍ وَأَبِي حَنِيفَةً وَابْنِ حَنْبَلٍ التقي الْأَوَّابِ Like a Shafi'i and Malik and Abi Hanifa and Ibn Hanbal, the pious and the fearful. So this is being a Wahhabi. So if somebody terms you or names you Wahhabi, then there's nothing wrong with it. Even though we don't accept that our religion goes back to a particular individual in time. So if Wahhabi is not a sect and neither is this name correct, then why are we studying the Wahhabi group or the Wahhabi movement in these series of lectures? Because of the importance of this movement. Because the movement, it still exists today, walhamdulillah. And there are various reasons, objectives and benefits from studying uh, the sect and studying groups and movement and especially studying this movement. The first of these benefits is because it is an obligation to love Tawheed and love the people of Tawheed. And it is an obligation to love the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because it is upon us to love the ulama and the nasiheen who sacrifice their lives in da'wah in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is an obligation to love Tawheed and the people of Tawheed and love the awliya of Allah and the love the shuhada and love the ulama. Why? In order we can follow them. This is why we love them. So the objective behind studying this movement, the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, it isn't taqdisul ashkhas. It isn't glorifying individuals and fanaticism to personalities. Rather, it is about knowing his movement and knowing what he called to, like we try to learn about all of the other great Imams and Ulama and the awliya of this religion. And for this reason, you realize from one of the clear distinctions of this da'wah is that if you look at the lectures and you go through the seminars and you look at the books, that which is written about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab as an individual is much less. And that which is written about his call and the explanation of his books and the message is much more. So many of you here will have studied Usulu Thalatha, Kitab Tawheed, Al Qa'id Al Arba'a, Kashf Al Shubahat, Al Usulu Sitta, and the other books of Al Imam Muhammad Al Duha, Nawaqid Al Islam, Fadail Al Islam. Yet yeah, perhaps very few of you actually know anything about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Rahimahullah. Because our call is always to the message, not necessarily the person. But we learn about the person because loving the people of Tawheed is from the love of a Tawheed. And as a side benefit, the ulama, they mention that it is obligatory upon a person to love four things. It is obligatory upon a person to love four things. Aside from loving Allah, aside from loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person has to love four things. A person has to love those places which Allah loves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves Mecca and al Madina. We as Muslims, we have to love Mecca and al Madina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves the Masajid. So we have to love the Masajid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves al Bayt al-Maqdas. So every Muslim has to love Bayt al-Maqdas. Secondly, a Muslim has to love every time which Allah loves. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves Ramadan. So we as Muslims, we have to love Ramadan. And the days of Dhul Hijjah, and Yawm Al Jum'ah, and so on and so forth. Also a person has to love every action which Allah loves. So Allah loves knowledge, therefore we have to love knowledge. Allah loves fasting, and praying, and dhikr, and sadaqah, so we have to also love these actions. And fourthly, a person has to love every person whom Allah loves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved Abu Bakr, he loved Umar. 
He loved Aisha radiallahu anha. He loved Khatija radiallahu anha. So we have to also love all of them. Also, Allah loves the ulama. We love the ulama. Allah loves the awliya. We love the awliya. Allah loves the mujahideen. We love the mujahideen. And so on and so forth. So part of studying and knowing about the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is showing this love. How is this love shown? Through studying him and his message and generally the ulama defending them, uh, maintaining their honor, reviving the heritage which they left behind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brought about Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab like those scholars who came before him in order to give victory to his religion. Because he called to at tawheed and he called to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And through his movement, much evil and much shirk and bid'ah was all removed. And this is the Sunnah and the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will aid and give victory to this religion. And had it not been Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, it would have been somebody else. But the point is that this religion, it will be supported and it will be aided. So even you as an individual, we know that this religion will gain ascendancy and victory. Now you choose. Do you want to be part of that victory or do you not want to be part of that victory? Whether you're involved or you're not involved, it doesn't matter. Because the religion of Allah will be supreme. بِعِزِّ عَزِيزٍ أو بِذِلِّ ذَلِيلٍ Either through you being honored or through you being humiliated, but the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be victorious. And Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا يَنْصُرُنَّ اللَّهِ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ And Allah will aid those who aid him. And Allah said in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ تَنْصُرُ اللَّهِ يَنْصُرْكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَكُمْ O people of Allah, if you aid Allah, meaning if you aid the religion of Allah, then Allah will give you victory. And he will make your feet firm. So this is what we have to think. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimullah, he was a person, Allah aided the religion through him, but had it not been him, it would have been somebody else. And the same with us. This religion will be aided, but you choose. Do you want to be part of that mission or not? And if you don't, Allah will bring somebody else. It doesn't matter because the religion of Allah, it will be aided. And truth has always been supported and victorious, always. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي على الحق There will never cease to be a group of people from my ummah upon the truth. The people of truth will always remain. Whether you're part of them or you're not part of them, that's your religion, that's your choice. But there will always be a group of people from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They will always be upon the truth and they will be victorious. Zahirin, apparent, victorious. And those who betray them will not harm them. Those who oppose them will not harm them. And this will remain thus until Yawm Al Qiyamah is established. The second reason why we study the movement of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah to know the reality of this movement. Because the reality of this movement has been, uh, the image has been corrupted by many of its enemies. So therefore you as a person of Tawheed need to know about this movement and what is said regarding this movement and what the reality of this movement is, who are its ulama. Why did it start? Where did it start from? What is the main message of this movement? Which books were authored during this movement? So then you can clarify the reality of this movement to the people. And as you know, Muhammad ibn Abd Abdul Wahhab rahimullah, he was hurt and he sacrificed a lot in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in bringing Tawheed to the people. And how could he not be? Because those who came before him, who delivered the same message, they had the same treatment. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasam, our prophet. Udiya wa udiya. He was hurt and he was tortured and he was exiled from his lands. Qutila and he was fought against. Wa qutila ashabu. And his companions were fought against only because of at tawheed Just of saying at tawheed Bilal radiallahu anhu. He'd be placed in, as you know, placed 
in the desert, in the scorching heat, with a big boulder over him. Why? He said, Allah, Allah, Ahad, Ahad. He would say, Allah, one. Allah, one. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before Islam, they used to call him a Sadiq al Amin, the truthful one, the trustworthy one, the one they used to love to socialize with and be with him. And he used to sort out their problems. As soon as he called to Tawheed, Kahin, Majnoon, Sahir, Sha'ir, a poet, a magician, a madman, a fortune teller, he only has with him Asatirul Awaleen, the tales of the early people. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to hear some of these things, he used to hurt him, but he would say, لَقَدْ أُوذِيَ مُوسَى بِأَكْثَرِ مِنْ هَذَا فَصَبَرْ Musa Alayhi Islam, he was tested with something more severe than this, but he remained patient. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ ابْتِلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلُ فَالْأَمْثَلُ Those people who face the most severe trials are the Prophets. Then those who are most closest to them, then those who are most closest to them. So because Muhammad ibn Abd Wahab rahimullah was closest in his message to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called to, then he also had a share of this hurt and these trials and tribulations. Up until today, he is called a kafir and his followers are called kuffar. The Wahhabis, me and you, even today, among some people, we are considered to be non-Muslim. They will not pray behind us. There are people, perhaps you've met them, that will travel all the way to Mecca and Medina to perform Umrah and yet they will pray the salawat in the hotel. Why? Because the Imam is a Wahhabi. Our prayer is not accepted behind this man. We've met these people, spoke to these people. They'll pray in the hotel and they have traveled all the way to Mecca and al Madina. So this is still in trying to harm Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah. Also, how this spread lies about him and false rumors about him, and we will cover these later on. And one of the benefits of studying this movement is so you can reply to these doubts. Because these doubts and these suspicions which are thrown and accusations which are thrown against the da'wah, sometimes they are from a political angle, sometimes they are from a religious angle, sometimes they are personal doubts and accusations against Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah. So how can you reply to them and clarify these things if you have not studied his da'wah and his life? Also from the benefits of studying his life and his movement is that it is an encouragement for us to learn and do righteous deeds and give da'wah and be patient. Because whoever reads about the struggles of the Salaf and the difficulties that they went through, then you find in it an inspiration that you want to be like them. And you don't mind going through what they went through in the name of Al-Islam. Like Allah said about the prophets and the messengers, He said, Allah fabihudahum iqtadeh. They are the ones whom Allah has guided, so follow their guidance. So this is one of the objectives of reading the lives of the Salaf and the great Imams. Because it is an encouragement for us and it inspires us to try to be like them. So whoever reads about how much Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab traveled to seek knowledge before he was 20, he'll be inspired and encouraged to travel and seek knowledge. And whoever reads about the ibadah of the Salaf, he'll be inspired to belittle his own ibadah and try to do more and more. And whoever reads about the great effort that the ulama placed in spreading Al-Islam will be inspired to also do so. And whoever reads about the patience which our Prophet had and the Imams had and Imam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab had in their personal lives and in the journey in giving da'wah will also be inspired to have this patience. And then the final reason and objective behind reading about Imam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab and the scholars who came before him is because we owe something to him. Every single one of us here, we have a great debt to pay to Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the other scholars who came before and after him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ لَا يَشْكُرِ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُ اللَّهِ Whoever does not show gratitude to the people who are deserving of his gratitude, does not show gratitude and thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we could almost say that there isn't a place or a masjid 
upon the earth from the east to the west, which is upon Tawheed, called to Tawheed, away from Shirk, away from Bid'ah, except that it has been influenced by the teachings of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah. The various movements in, in the world, like in the Indo Pak subcontinent, the movement of Ahlul Hadith, they were influenced greatly by the works of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. The movements in Egypt, like Ansar al Sunnah, they were greatly influenced by the works of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Even us here, this institute, may Allah place blessings in it, Medina College. We have studied and taught and learned about Tawheed through the books of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Rahimullah. So consider this we're sitting here today, 300 years after he has died, in the heart of the lands of the non Muslims, in the capital of this area of Kufr, and yet we are studying the books and learning Tawheed through the books of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Rahimullah. So, one of the reasons why we study him is to repay this debt. So we defend his honor against the false accusations and we teach his books and we spread his teachings and the ulama who came before him and the ulama who came after him. The next part is regarding his life. And before we begin, there are four uh, main sources in which the historical accounts of the Wahhabi movement is taken from. Four main sources. Two are classical books, or we could say three are classical books, and then the fourth is a modern book. The first and the most primary source of history when it comes to Da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Dohab is a book by Hussein ibn Ghannam, Al-Ihsai. And his book in Arabic, it is called Tariq al-Najd, the history of al-Najd. And he is, as I mentioned, Hussein ibn Ghannam Al-Ihsai. This person, Hussein ibn Ghannam al Ihsai, and the book is printed by in Arabic. He was from the students of Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Rahimullah. So he himself, he was a scholar of aqeed and fiqh and hadith and history. And he was there at the time of Al Imam Muhammad. He traveled from Ahsa to study with Al Imam Muhammad in Dir'iyah. And Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he requested from him to write the history. He requested from him to write down the history of this movement. And this is from the intelligence of Al Imam, Al -Mu Al -Imam Muhammad. Rahimahullah. Why? Because he knew because of the many enemies which will come, people will start writing their own accounts of the history. And when they do, they will add and they will take away and they will exaggerate and they will insinuate and accuse of things. For this reason, he wanted somebody from his own students to write the account of the history as it was from the beginning of the da'wah to the ending of the da'wah. And so Ibn Ghannam al-Ihsai, Hussein Ibn Ghannam in his book Tariq al-Najd, he wrote from the beginning of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab to six years after his death. The second book which was written is also known as Tariq al-Najd and is, it is by somebody called Ibn Bishr al-Najdi. Uthman ibn Bishr and Najdi, also called Tariq and Najd. However, Uthman ibn Bishr and Najdi, he never uh, met Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Rather, he studied with the sons of Al Imam Muhammad and his students. So he was also a historian and a scholar from the students of knowledge from An Najd, and he also wrote a great account of the history. Then the third source or the writings of the scholars at that time themselves. The Shaykh and the students of the Shaykhs and the grandson and the children of the Shaykh, the Imam, they also wrote about some of the things that they went through. And they wrote treaties to various areas and various regions. And they advised people through their letters. This is also a source of history for us. And then the fourth book is a modern book by somebody called Abdullah al-Uthaymin. Abdullah al-Uthaymin. Uh, and I think his book is called Tariq al-Dawla al-Mamlaka al-Saudi or something along this line. Two volumes and it's printed in Arabic. The history of the da'wah, it can be divided into four different stages. The history of this movement and the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, it can be divided into four different stages. The first stage is the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his movement 
before the existence of the Saudi state. There was no Saudi state and there was his da'wah and everything that he went through. This is the first phase. And then the three other phases are the first Saudi kingdom and the second Saudi kingdom and the third Saudi kingdom. So what we know as today as being the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in reality, there were three kingdoms of Saudi Arabia. There wasn't only one. And each one was destroyed and defeated until the third one came. And that which is here today is an extension of the third Saudi kingdom. So the first Saudi kingdom, it lasted about 76 years. And it lasted a few years after Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimullah, he passed away. And then it was defeated. And then the second kingdom, it uh, seven years passed after the first kingdom had pa passed away. And then the second kingdom was established. And this lasted 70 years. And then a number of years went, I think uh, 10 years, yes, 10 years or 12 years passed by after the second kingdom. And then the third kingdom was established. And that, and today is an extension of the third Saudi kingdom. So Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he is Muhammad, the son of Abdul Wahab, the son of Suleiman, Ibn Ali, Ibn Muhammad, al wahhabi Al-Tamimi. And this is important, that he's from Bani Tamim. He's from the tribe of Al-Tamim. Many of you will have heard of uh, the doubt that some of the people of innovation and deviation, they spread. They say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the horns of shaitan will appear from a najd And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was from Najd. Without any doubt, he was from a najd There's also second hadith that isn't mentioned by those people. And this hadith is upon the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Authentic. That Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said, لا أزال أحب بني تميم لثلاث سمعتهن من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, I will never stop loving Bani Tamim. And Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he's a Tamim, he's from Bani Tamim. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, I will never love I will never stop loving Bani Tamim for three reasons that I heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first reason that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hum ashaddu ummati ala dajjal That Bani Tamim will be the most severe people against Dajjal. They will fight against Dajjal the best. The second reason, he said, Atat as sadaqat min Bani Tamim. Charity or zakah, it came from Bani Tamim. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, هذا صدقات قومنا That this is the charity of our own people, Bani Tamim. And thirdly, he said, كانت سبية منهم عند عائشة رضي الله عنها That Aisha رضي الله عنها, she had with her a slave from Bani Tamim. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, أعتقها فإنها من ولد إسماعيل Free this slave because she's from the children of Ismail. So Bani Tamim, it has a virtue to it. And Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, he was born 1115 Hijri, meaning 1115 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And to bring this closer to our context, in the Gregorian calendar, 1703, meaning he was born 316 years ago. This is when he was born, 316 years ago. And he was born in a small town or a small village called Al-Uyayna. And Al-Uyayna is a village or a small town in an najd 30 kilometers northwest of Riyadh. And when Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Duha was born, the society or the environment in which he was born in was a society which resembled the Jahiliya that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to. Resembled. Meaning some of the aspects of shirk that were there at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of the society had reverted back to that. Like in some of the Muslim countries today. The country which I come from and the country which maybe some of you come from as well. If you go back to the villages, you see aspects of shirk in which hopes are being hung on trees and amulets are being worn and people in the graves are being prostrated in front of 
like what used to happen at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the same in Uyayna. And Ibn Ghannam, the same historian, he mentions how the Jazeera al-Arab, the Arabian Peninsula, as well as the other countries, Egypt and Turkey and Morocco and these other countries which were under the Ottoman Empire, how they were also in the same situation, bid'ah and shirkiyat and khurafat and these types of things. In fact, the brother of Umar ibn Khattab, his name was Zayd ibn Khattab. And Zayd ibn Khattab, there was a grave or a mausoleum in Uyayna at that time. And the people used to go and worship and invoke uh, Zayd ibn Khattab, uh, they would go to this mausoleum. Also Ibn Ghannam, he mentions that in Uyayna, there were 17 trees. And all of these 17 trees used to be worshipped. And other aspects of Jahli and Shirk and Khurafat, like we find in some of the Muslim countries today. So this is the environment which Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimullah, which he came to. And Muhammad, and of course, there was still some knowledge, like in some of the Muslim countries today, there is knowledge, there are the people of knowledge, but at the same time in the villages, there is aspects of Shirk and uh, Khurafat and Bid'ah. The family of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is renowned for knowledge. So his father, Abdul Wahhab, was a Qadi. He was a judge of the Hanbali Madhab in Uyayna. And his grand grandfather, Sulaiman ibn Ali, was considered to be a Mufti at that time. They used to call him Mufti al Diyar al Najdiyya, the Mufti of the lands of Al Najd. And so Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, he took from this knowledge. And he learned the fiqh at the hands of the Hanbali ulama. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, from a young age, he was known for his intelligence and how quick and sharp he was, such that he memorized Quran when he was seven years old. And also it is said, Wallahu A'lam, that he married when he was 12 years old. He married when he was 12 years old. There's brothers here who are perhaps 20, 30, maybe 40, and they're not married. And the fact that he was married at 12 years old, this is also important. It shows the maturity which he had even as a young boy. Even at 12 years old, he had reached an age of maturity in that his father married him off. And then after this, and he was very young, he was still a teenager, under 20 years old, maybe 17 or 18, he left Uyayna after seeking knowledge with the people of Uyayna and he started traveling. So he traveled to various lands like Mecca and Medina and Ihsa. He also traveled to Iraq in Al-Basra in order to seek knowledge. When he came to Medina, and I think he stayed in Medina for two years, this had the greatest effect upon him. So his stay in Medina, in which he's taught and studied knowledge, this had the greatest impact upon him. Because in Medina, he met two particular scholars. First of them, Ibrahim ibn Saif al Najdi, and the second of them, Muhammad Hayat al Sindhi from al Sind. And these two scholars, they used to attach a great importance to the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and the books of Ibn Qayyim. And they used to also emphasize the importance of Aqeedah, of Tawheed, one against Bid'ah, and so on and so forth. So he was greatly influenced by these two scholars. And Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi, you'll find that name repeated over and over again when you read the biography of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimullah. So they were known for despising ta'assub and despising sectarianism and despising a stubborn blind following. They were known for their love of the sunnah and important sunnah and so on and so forth. So Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, because of these two teachers, he also started benefiting from the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim. And this shows the importance of teachers and scholars who are righteous, that they can literally change the course of history. And after this, he then went to Al-Basra in Iraq, also to seek knowledge. However, when he came to uh, Al-Basra, he noticed how even the ulama, some of the ulama there, they were practicing bid'at and they were spreading falsehood. So he began to discuss with them and advise them and debate them. And he was still under 20 years old. Also, it is mentioned that Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab, his grandson mentions that 
when he went to perform Hajj, when he went to Mecca to perform Hajj, he, sto- he stood in front of the Kaaba, وَسَأَلَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَ أَنْ يُضِّرَ هَذَا الدِّينَ بِدَعْوَتِهِ And then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the religion victorious through his da'wah. وَأَنْ يُرْزِقَهُ الْقُبُولِ مِنَ النَّاسِ That Allah gives him acceptance amongst the people. And this is also important. All of these are lessons that we can learn. So it's important to give da'wah to a person, but it's also important to make dua for that person. Not that, well, I've given him the da'wah, I've established the evidence against him, the hujah's evidence, now I can label him with something. No. You give da'wah, then you make dua. Oh Allah, make this person accept the da'wah. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama." Oh Allah, make us for the pious people an imam. And whilst the imam was in Basra in Iraq, and he was still under 20 years old, this is where he wrote his great book, Kitab al-Tawheed. When he saw the mistakes and the deviations that people are making, this is where he wrote Kitab al-Tawheed. And also in this is a lesson for us. That Muhammad ibn Abd wahhab he didn't used to write books for gain and fame. Nahsabu kathalik. Rather, he wrote books when there was a need to do so. So he saw the people in Basra deviating aspects of Tawheed, so he wrote Kitab at Tawheed. And many of his writings are pieces of advice. Many of his writings and treaties which we study is actually an advice or a letter which is sent to a particular people or a particular tribe. And then once he became known for his writings and his debate and discussing with the ulama and refuting them in Basra, then he was exiled from Al-Basra. And he was threatened. His life was threatened. So he left Al-Basra and he started making his way back to Al-Najd. And on the way, it is mentioned by some of the historians that he almost died in the desert due to the severe thirst until Allah saved him through a person who was passing by who gave him some refuge and gave him some water. After this, Imam Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, he returned back to Najd and he passed by Al-Ihsa. And he stayed with some of the scholars in Al-Ihsa, like Muhammad, Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abd al-Latif Al-Ihsa'i. And also this scholar, he was greatly influenced by the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim alayhim rahmatullah. So again, he was, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab was influenced by their books. Then he went to a place called Huraymala. And the reason why he went there is because his father, Abdul Wahhab ibn Sulaiman, he had left Uyayna at this time because of a dispute he had had with the leader of Uyayna. So he had gone to this area. And so also Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he went there. And he stayed there for a number of years until he was 38 years old. At 38 years old, his father he passed away in this area. And whilst Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was in this city, he spent most of his time in writing, in writing and uh, authoring books and treaties and responding to the various doubts. However, he never began to openly call the people until his father died. After his father died and he became known and he began to teach the people, then he began to openly call the people to a tawheed and then as I mentioned he became known and so people would start traveling to, to him from the various areas in an najd and then after this he uh, went back to Uyayna and he stayed in Uyayna and there he was protected by the ruler of Uyayna And the ruler of Uyina, his name was Uthman ibn Mu'ammar. Uthman ibn Mu'ammar. And Uthman ibn Mu'ammar, when he saw the success of this da'wah and the fruits of this da'wah, he invited him back to Uyina. He gave him protection. He said, I will aid your da'wah. And this is when the grave of Zayd ibn Khattab, the brother of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, when it was destroyed. So it is mentioned that Muhammad ibn Abd Wahhab, he would advise the ruler of Uyina. Mu'ammar ibn Uthman, he would advise him. And one of the advice which he gave was regarding this mausoleum. So they rode on their horses, a group of men, and Muhammad ibn al was amongst them. 
and they traveled out to the outskirts of this area. They went to the tomb and they erased this tomb. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to send his emissaries with. So he sent to Ali radiallahu anhu and he said to him when he sent him to Yemen, he said, لا تدع صورة إلا تمسته ولا قبرا مشرفا إلا سويته Do not leave any image until you have defaced the image. And do not leave any grave which is above the ground until you have leveled the grave. So Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, he not only taught at Tawheed, but he practically implemented Tawheed like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had ordered his companions to do so. And he carried on teaching and his fame grew and his name grew and people started coming towards him. Then there was a particular instance or particular thing which happened in Uyayna. And that was that a woman came to Muhammad ibn the Wahhab and she admitted zina. And this woman, she was from the Shurafa, she was, from, she was a woman of high lineage from the tribes known for their lineage. So she admitted four times that she has committed zina. And she wants the had of zina to be established upon her as a form of purification. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, he asked her four times, he turned away and asked her four times, and she admitted in doing so. So he stoned her. And this was, as they say, the straw which broke the camel's back. Because there was already pressure on the rule of Uyayna to exile Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. The pressure was already there. Because he is calling against a shir to Tawheed, destroying the graves, establishing the sunnah. So the other rulers of the tribes in that region, they were already becoming fearful and jealous of this person. And so they started pressurizing the rule of Uyayna to exile him and stop supporting him. But when this thing happened, then it became even worse. So now the traders and the rich people and those who were connected, all of them started boycotting Uyayna. Sanctions were placed upon Uyayna. So the ruler, Ibn Mu'ammar, he exile the Shaykh, even though the Shaykh tried to tell him about patience and this is the religion of Allah and Allah will bring you victory and victory is for the religion of Allah, it will be supreme, but the pressure and the sanctions were too much. So then Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, he was exiled from Uyayna and he went to a Dir'iyah. And when he went to Dir'iyah, another town, he sought refuge in the house in one of his students. So imagine this, He's being exiled now from town to town to town. And how embarrassing is it for a person, for an older person, a sheikh, an imam, to have to go seek refuge in the house of one of the students. Yet he had to do so in the way of a da'wah. And when he was in Dir'iyah, some of his students, they were connected to the Amir of Dir'iyah. And the name of the Amir was Muhammad ibn Saud. And it is mentioned that some of the students, they approached his wife first because his wife was known to be a righteous woman. So they approached her and they encouraged her to speak to her husband to come and listen to the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah. So this is also something that we should not forget that we also owe a great debt to a woman and she was the wife of Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud who was the Amir or the leader of the tribe in ad diriyah and so Amir Muhammad ibn Saud, he came to the house of the student, he sat with the Shaykh, he listened to the Shaykh, he listened to his da'wah, and then a historical alliance, it took place. That Al Amir Muhammad ibn Saud, he promised to support him and aid him and uh, allow him to convey his message in a dir'iyah. And then again, the students started coming to dir'iyah, studying, the Shaykh became famous. He started cultivating certain students, a movement was started. And the people of Dir'iyah, they would give refuge to the students who would come from the other areas of An Najd. And of course, at that time, the, those who were around at Dir'iyah, they were still enemies of the Da'wah. So they started attacking and fighting, and particularly the Amir of Riyadh at that time. And his name was Diham ibn Dawas. And he went and he started attacking at Dir'iyah and attacking Imam Muhammad ibn Dawhab and his students, meaning physically fighting against them. And this is also important that we should know because a doubt which is thrown against the movement and the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Dawhab is that it was a destructive da'wah. And it was a da'wah which called to violence and killing. 
and this is what he was known for and it's the opposite rather the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Ibn Wahhab was islahiyah it was a re reformative da'wah a call to reform and not destruction and also Al-Imam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab he never began with the fighting rather he began with defending themselves it was other people who attacked them so the Imam was in Dir'iyah under uh, within the tribe or the rulership of Muhammad ibn Saud, calling da'wah, calling to the da'wah of Allah, the students were coming to him. It was some of the other umara at that time who began to attack them physically, and that's why Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab he says himself, he says, "Wa amal qital." As for fighting, falam nuqatil ahdan ila liyom. We have never fought against anybody to this day, illa dun nafs wal hurma, except in trying to protect our own lives and trying to protect our own uh, honor. And they are the ones who have come to us in our lands, attacking us and trying to destroy us. And Ibn Ghannam, the historian, he said, That he, the Imam, he never ordered with the spilling of blood. And he never ordered with fighting against the majority of the people of innovation. Until they initiated a takfir and they initiated attacks against them. And so the ulama, the students of knowledge, they protected themselves. And also the great grandson of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he's Abdul Latif ibn Abdul Rahman. He said, "I'lam anna shaykhana min a'zam al nas wa aktharihim rifqan wa hilma." You should know that our Sheikh, I Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he was from the greatest of people in his gentleness and his tolerance. Wal wukufu ma al hujjati wa dalil, and he would stop wherever the evidence stopped. Walam yabda ahdan bi qatlin or bi qitalin, and he never started or initiated with anybody fighting and killing. Hatta badauhu wa kafaruhu until they started against him and they held him to be a disbeliever. So these people, because of tawhid, only because of tawhid, they start calling him. These are disbelievers. These are kuffar. These are calling against religion of our forefathers, we have to kill them, we have to fight them. And so the fight, it started. And, and like this, this is how the fight, it started. So then armies would be organized and the army of Muhammad ibn Saud at that time and the students of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Dhuhab, they would be organized. And Imam Muhammad ibn Dhuhab, he himself would take part in the fighting. He himself was at the forefront of the jihad against the people who are trying to destroy a tawheed. And also, they would organize the uh, armies together. And slowly, slowly, the army of Amir Muhammad ibn Saud and with him, Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, it gained victory over the other regions. And almost all of Najd, if not all of Najd, it came under the rule of Amir Muhammad ibn Saud. Until even Riyadh, and at that time, Riyadh was the one which had the most severe enemy against the da'wah of Imam Muhammad, it came under the rule of Imam Muhammad ibn Duhab rahimahullah. And this remained the state until Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud, he died at 1179 Hijri, i.e. 1779 Hijri. And at that time, uh, 1779 Miladi. And at that time, the Imam was 76 years old. So when Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud died, the Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he was 76 years old. After Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud came Al-Amir Abdul Aziz, the son of Muhammad ibn Saud. And he was also known to be a righteous person. In fact, he was a student of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So even before the state ever came, the sons of Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud, they used to study knowledge with the Imam. And Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud, he was one of the greatest students of Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab. He has books and writings which he wrote. But we're not talking about King Abdul Aziz of the Third Kingdom, we're talking the one who came much before him. And also he was known for justice. Until they said so much, uh, Ibn Bashir, who wrote Tariq al-Najd, he said, وَلَمْ يَأْتِي بَعْدَ عُمْرِ بْنَ عَبْدَ الْعَزِيزِ مِنَ الْأُمَرَى وَالْمُلُوكِ مَنْ عُرِفَ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْدِيَانِتِ وَالْقُوَّةِ وَالْأَمَانَةِ مِثْلُ أَمِيرَ عَبْدَ الْعَزِيزِ ibn Muhammad ibn Saud. He says, since the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great Khalifa, 
at the time of the Umawin. No other leader, no other ruler has come and he's known for his justice and he's known for his religiosity and he's known for his piety and he's known for his strength and trustworthiness like Al-Amir Abdulaziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud. And then after this, of course, at this, at this time, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he was old, 76 years old, he's getting older and slowly, slowly, he became older and he weakened and he passed away. Uh, when the Sheikh became old in age, the administrative duties of the Dawla, he left all of them. And he said he concentrated on the Dawah itself, writing and advising and just the Dawah. I remember studying at the time when we studied Islamic history in Medina, that the agreement between Muhammad ibn Saud and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was that the, the Ministry of Finances would be under the hand of the ulama. So Al-Amir Muhammad ibn Saud, they would take charge of the administrative duties and protecting the state. As for the Ministry of Finance, then this would be under the hands of the ulama, the hands of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah. But due to old age, Imam Muhammad, he left that alone. He gave it back to them so he could concentrate on a da'wah. And this also shows us Sidquniyah, the truthfulness in his intention, how truthful he was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That had he wanted money and finance authority, the state was already his, the ministry was already his. But he chose it to give it up and leave it to those who could do better in order to continue the da'wah. Now, at that time, just before the death of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the Sharif of Mecca, the rule of Mecca at that time, he started writing to the Ottomans that there is a movement which is appearing and this movement has gained strength in Najd and something needs to be done about this movement. And he wrote a letter to the Ottomans in 1163 Hijri warning them against the expansion of this movement. In fact, it is also mentioned that the Sharif of Mecca at that time, he, when some of the students of the Imam, they went to do Hajj in Mecca, he captured 60 of them, 60 of the people of An Najd, and he imprisoned them in Mecca. And then anybody who came from An Najd, from the students of the followers of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, they were barred and banned from making Hajj. And this continued for 56 years, from 1162 Hijri to 1218 Hijri. Nobody from Najd or from the students of Imam Muhammad Imam Abdul Wahhab were allowed to enter into Mecca. So this shows us once again that the animosity started from the Ashraf and from the Ottomans towards the Dawah of Imam Muhammad Imam Abdul Wahhab rahimullah. And so when this started happening and the follows were banned from going to Hajj, Al-Emir Abdul Aziz started sending the scholars to Mecca to go debate with them, to go uh, discuss with them, to give them advice, but it did not change. Ala kulli hal al-Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab, he died 1206 Hijri, i.e. 1795 Miladi, and at that time he was 92 years old. Rahimullah rahmatan wasi'a. So, so this was regarding the, his life. After this, of course, after a short while, uh, the, the, the first Saudi kingdom it was destroyed by the Ottomans. The Ottomans came uh, using the forces of the Pasha, and the Pasha were the rulers of Egypt. So at that time, the rulers of Egypt, they remained rulers of Egypt, but in alliance to the Ottomans. So it was like a friendly alliance under the lines of the Ottomans, but it was a sub semi-independent state. Muhammad Ali Bash and Ibrahim Bash and so on and so forth. So they came and they attacked Najd and they defeated Muhammad ibn Saud and many of the ulama, they were taken. The grandson, I think, yeah, Suleiman uh, ibn Hussein ibn Muhammad ibn Wahhab, the grandson of Muhammad ibn Wahhab, the one who wrote Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid, Shar Kitab al-Tawheed, the most extensive Shar of Kitab al-Tawheed. He was taken from Najd, he was taken to Egypt, it's mentioned in the, in the introduction to the book. He was put in front of the firing line, and the firing squad, and they killed him by shooting at him. Many of the ulama, 
many of the ulama and also many of the umara, they were taken to Istanbul, they were taken to Turkey, they were taken to Egypt, and they were hanged and they were killed. Also, the forces of Ibrahim Basha entered into a Dir'iya and annihilated a Dir'iya and totally leveled a Dir'iya. And also, uh, there's also another important point. That when Ibrahim ibn Ali Basha, when he came and he defeated the scholars and the, uh, the first Saudi kingdom and they leveled uh, a Dir'iya, which was at that time the head of the kingdom, there was a British colonial and his name was Captain George Foster Sadlia. And he actually came to Najd in order to congratulate Ibrahim Ali Pasha for defeating the as they would say, the Wahhabis. So again, this is another thing to bear in mind. Because people often say that the British were supporting the Wahhabis and it was a British movement and it was a, free, a Masonic movement. It was the other way around. He wrote this in his own diaries. And I was looking all in Google today. So he wrote a book, A Journey Across Arabia, by Captain George Foster Sadlia. In the introduction to this book, it says, one of the rarest of all the European travels in Arabia. Sadlia was the first recorded British tra traveler to enter Najd. In 1819, the government of the East Indian Company, which was the British company in uh, India, anxious to eliminate the Wahhabi pirates who were preying on trade in the Persian Gulf, sent Sadlia to enter negotiations with Ibrahim Ali Pasha and offer encouragement to Ibrahim to continue his campaign. So notice where the animosity, where it is starting from. Then, after a while, uh, the second uh, Saudi kingdom, it was established. The, Sa the second Saudi kingdom, it also broke down. But the reason why this broke down was because of uh, a dispute within the family of al Saud. So, the ruler at that time, And he was, I think his name was Abdullah, uh, from the family of Saud. Or rather, it was Faisal ibn Turki. Faisal ibn Turki, the ruler from the family of Saud. When he died, he left behind four sons Saud, and Abdullah, and uh, Abdurrahman, and Muhammad. And two of the sons, Abdullah and Saud, they started fighting against each other. Who is the one who should have the kingdom? And because of this infighting, then also the second kingdom, it broke down and it became extinct. <coughs> and then Ibn Rashid, he came and he exploited this difference and he became the ruler of an Najd. And the majority of al Saud, they were all exiled to Al-Kuwait. And they sought refuge under the family of al Sabah who are there now. So this alliance between al Saud and al Sabah, it is from that time. And that's why they are so close to each other. Because al Sabah who are the rulers of Kuwait right now, they gave refuge to al Saud when they were exiled in uh, Kuwait. And amongst the family in Al-Kuwait was one of the princes called Abdul Aziz. And Abdul Aziz is said with 60 men, he one day he came back to Riyadh, which has now become the capital of An-Najd. And throughout the night, he, they, they went over the roofs and the journey and the story is famous. And they captured Riyadh from the rule of that time and then the kingdom grew and it became stabilized and so the third Saudi kingdom is the kingdom as it was today uh, after this what we need to know is what were the main principles of this movement what were the main teachings of this movement I said that the movement and the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab it was an extension of the movement of the Salaf and the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the same Aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah, these are the same teachings of Imam Muhammad. But there's four things particularly that we want to concentrate on. The first and the most important message which he called to was at tawhid wal Ikhlas. And this is clear for everybody. All of the treaties which you have studied and read, all of them concentrate on at tawhid and al Ikhlas. And the usul of Ahlul Sunnah, many, there are many usul of Ahlul Sunnah. And this is Aslul Usul. 
This is the very core principle from all the foundations of Ahl Sunnah, at tawheed and Al-Ikhlas. The second thing which he concentrated on was Tajridul Ittiba' li Rasulillah. That absolute following is only for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he would take his Aqeedah from the Salaf and he was humbly, Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his teachings and his students was humbly, the fiqh of the Hanabila. But the evidences were more beloved to them. So if there was something clearly wrong in the madhab and it was aided by an authentic hadith, then they would take the authentic hadith. So also tajridul ittiba. Absolute following has to be for the Prophet. And, and this is clear. Al Quran was Sunnah. Then there's a third thing. And maybe people will miss out the third thing. The third most important message of Imam Muhammad ibn Duhab was unity, al ijtima And you'll see this in his books again and again and again. al usulu Sitta, the six fundamental principles. The first principle is Ikhlas al Ibadah. The second principle is al ijtima that we have to be united. So Muhammad ibn Duhab, he brought a message which was reformative, unifying, not destructive, not trying to disunite the people. And because of this, that area, the Jazeera, it was the area of tribes and fighting and different groups and different rulers and constantly fighting with each other. Yet Allah brought unity in that whole area through Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah. In fact, in the first kingdom, the first Saudi kingdom, the kingdom it extended to Iraq and Amman and Yemen and Bahrain and some of the Emirates. All of this came under the first Saudi kingdom which is when Muhammad ibn Abdul Ha was giving his da'wah because he called to unity and this is also important in our da'wah we shouldn't be those people who are trying to disunite the Muslims or trying to have an exclusive da'wah and we're known by this and you guys are known by this rather we have tried to unite the people but what do we unite them upon? upon ikhlas and upon al-ittiba upon sincerity and tawheed and upon following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and that's why it's strange subhanallah they find some brothers who call to the way of the Salaf and the biggest thing which is known about them is they are disuniting the people. And we're not talking about disuniting Ahlul Bid'ah, we're talking about disuniting the people of At-Tawheed. So the people of Tawheed, those who are following the way of the Salaf, one of their main aims is to disunite them, cause problems between them. You're this label and you're that label. This isn't the da'wah of the Imams. This isn't the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He tried to unite all of the Muslims. Never mind disuniting those who follow the sunnah in the first place. Also, what his da'wah is known for is moderation. The da'wah of Muhammad Abdul Wahab is known for moderation. He never went to any one of the extremes. So he refuted the murji'ah because they are at one extreme. At the same time, he refuted the khawarij because they are at another extreme. He also f- refuted the ghulat al-sufiyyah because they went to an extreme. As for Muhammad Abdul Wahab, his da'wah was a da'wah of moderation and reformation and a da'wah of trying to bring people together and be united. And after this, and now we're summarizing because of the time, what are the doubts which are spread regarding the imam or his da'wah or his followers? The first of these doubts was, and you'll be shocked by this subhanAllah, that he did not accept the last prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They should throw this doubt at him. He never accepted that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the last prophet. In fact, one of the worst enemies, Ibn Dahlan, Ibn Dahlan, he states in his book, Ad-Durar, he says, وَالظَّاهِرْ مِنْ حَالِي مُحَمَّدْ ibn Abdul Wahab أَنَّهُ يَدْعِي النَّبُوَّةِ He said, what is clear from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is that he is going to prophethood, that he is a prophet. He said, إِلَّا أَنَّهُ مَا قَدَّرَ عَلَىٰ إِظْهَارَ التَّصْرِيحِ بِذَلِكِ Except he wasn't able to openly profess this. So if he never openly professed it, then how do you know that he called to prophethood? And others said this as well. So he said also, Dahlan, he said, فَكَأَنَّهُ يَضْمَرُ فِي نَفْسِهِ دَعْوَىٰ النُّبُوَّةِ It's as if he's hiding inside him a call to prophethood. وَلَوْ أَمْكَنَهُ إِظْهَارَ هَذِهِ الدَّعْوَةِ لَأَظْهَرَهَا And if he was able to profess 
this claim, then he would have professed it. وَكَانَ يَقُولُ لِأَتَبَاعِهِ And he used to say to his students, إِنِّي آتِيكُمْ بِدِينٍ جَدِيدٍ I have come to you with a new religion. And he said this was apparent from his statements and his actions. Also from the, peop- the evil scholars of that time, somebody called Alawi ibn Ahmad al-Haddad, he said, وَكَانَ يَضْمِرُ دَعْوَ النُّبُوَّةِ that he, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he used to hide inside him the claim to prophethood. And Al Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab, he himself, he said, "U'minu bi anna Nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam khatim al I believe that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was the last of the prophets and the messengers. وَلَا يَصِحُ إِيمَانُ أَبْدٍ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنَ بِرِسَالَتِهِ وَيَشْهَدُ بِنُبُوَّتِهِ And the iman of a person is not valid until he believes in the finality of the messenger of the, the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The second doubt that was thrown against him is that he negates a shafa'ah. The intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he disbelieves in it. And this is the same doubt which is thrown at us today. That you people, you are munkiri a shafa'a. You disbelieve in the shafa'a. And this, if any of you have studied al qawaid al arbaa he mentions, he says, a shafa'atu shafa'atani. He said that the shafa'a, there are two types of shafa'a. Shafa'atun manfiya wa shafa'atun muthbita. There is a shafa'a which we negate and reject, and then there is a shafa'a which we accept and we believe in. He said, wa amma shafa'at al manfiya ma kanat tutlabu min ghayrillah. It is that intercession which is being sought from other than Allah in something which only Allah is able to provide. Meaning, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, because he called against shirk and slaughtering names, uh, slaughtering animals in the name of people and jinn, and invoking the awliya and invoking the people in the graves, he is a munkir of a shafa'a. Whereas in reality, he affirmed the correct as shafa'a. He said, in one of his rasail in Durr al-Siniya, he said, يَزْعَمُونَ أَنَّنَا نُنْكِرُ شَفَاعَةَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. They claim that we disbelieve in the shafa'a of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ He said, glorified be Allah, this is a severe lie. بَلْ نُشْهِدُ اللَّهِ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم الشافع المشفع. Rather, we call Allah to be our witness that we believe that the Prophet is a shafi he will intercede and his intercession will be accepted. Also, one of the doubts which is thrown regarding him is that he was from the Khawarij. That Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, he was from the Khawarij. And that he made takfir of the ummah by mass. He considered all of the ummah or the majority of the ummah to be al-kuffar. And Ibn Dahlan, the same one, he said, وَسَعَى بِتَكْفِيرٍ لِلْأُمَّةِ خَاصَّهَا وَعَامَّهَا أُخَاصِهَا وَعَامِّهَا وَقَاتَلَهَا عَلَى ذَلِكَ جُمْلَةً إِلَّا مَنْ وَافَقَهُ عَلَى قَوْلِهِ He said that he, the Imam, he made takfir of the Ummah. Unrestrictedly, he made takfir of the Ummah. And he would fight them, all of them, except the one who agreed with him. And also, also Alawi al-Haddad, he said, إِذَا أَرَادَ الرَّجُلْ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ فِي دِينِهِ That if a person came and he wanted to enter into the religion of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, then Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab would say to him, إِشْهَدْ عَلَى نَفْسِكَ أَنَّكَ كُنْتَ كَافِرًا First, before you enter into my religion, testify against your own self that you used to be a disbeliever. وَشْهَدْ عَلَى وَالِدَيْكَ أَنَّهُمَا مَاتَا كَافِرَيْنِ and bear witness against your own parents that they died as kuffar. وَشْهَدْ عَلَى الْعَالَمَ الْفُلَّانِ وَالْعَالَمَ الْفُلَّانِ أَنَّهُمْ كُفَّارِ And you have to testify that this scholar and that scholar, they were all kuffar. فَإِنْ شَهِدَ بِذَلِكَ قَبِلَهُ So if this person, he testified to this, then they would accept him. وَإِلَّا قَتَلَهُ Otherwise they would kill him. And many other things in this same meaning, which were mentioned regarding Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab rahimahullah. And he clarifies it. He said, وَأَمَّا الْكَذِبُ الْبُهْتَانِ And as for the lies and the fabrications, فَمِثْلُ قَوْلِهِمْ Like the statement, إِنَّا نُكَفِّرُ بِالْعُمُومِ That we consider everybody to be a kafir. وَنُوجِبُ الْهِجْرَةِ إِلَيْنَا 
and we obligate the hijrah to us. And we consider those to be kuffar who don't make the kafir of others. He said, all of this all of this is a fabrication. All of these are lies. And they only want to prevent the people from the religion of Allah and from the messenger. Subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. Glorified be Allah. This is a severe lie. Also, he mentions the guidelines upon which he used to make takfir. Al Imam Muhammad ibn Dawhab. He said, takfir, as for making rule, rulings of a takfir, fa'ana ukafiru man arafa dina rasulillah. I only make takfir upon a person who knows the religion of the messenger. Thumma ba'da ma arafahu sabbahu. And then after knowing the true religion of the Prophet, he insults and mocks it. anhu. And he forbids the people from the message of the messenger. Wa'ada man fa'alahu. And he holds animosity against those who follow the way of the messenger. This is the person I make takfir upon. I mean, not the ignorant people. Not the general masses, but somebody who knows Tawheed, he knows religion, he mocks the religion, he insults the religion, he fights against religion, he prevents people accepting the religion. These are the people that we make a takfir of. He said, umma. However, the majority of the um ummah, walillah alhamd, laysu kathalik. The majority of the ummah, and for Allah's all praise, are not like this. So this is also fabrication against him. Also from the fabrications, is that he came with a new madhab. And this is clearly false. Because as I mentioned, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimullah, he was a follower of the Hanbali madhab. And in many, many of his statements, and we don't have time to go through, through them, he said, I respect the four madhahib. And he would teach the madhab of the Hanabila. Also, from the sta uh, doubts which are thrown against him, is that he rebelled against the Ottoman Empire. And perhaps that was the question which was intended by the brother as well. This is a doubt that he rebelled against the Ottoman Empire. Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Dawhab. Firstly, this can't be true because the Ottoman Empire, it, not all of the Muslim countries were under the Ottoman Empire. There were many countries which didn't come under the Ottoman Empire. From those lands was the area of Najd. So Najd was never under the control of the Ottomans. Rather, Najd was always ruled by individual tribes and individual chiefs. And some of the names we have already mentioned. Like Ibn Mu'ammar and the other names which we mentioned. So the only thing that Imam Muhammad Ibn Dhuhab did is that when people started attacking a dir'iyya, then they fought back. And this is when the fight it started initially. Secondly, if you remember, it was the Sharif of Mecca who wrote to the Ottomans advising them that this is now a threat and it needs to be fought against. And so the Ottomans sent uh, Muhammad Ali Basha, who then sent his son Ibrahim Basha to go fight the uh, Wahhabi movement. So this is where it started. And also, was Mecca and Medina ever under the control of the Ottomans? Never directly. So at that time, the Ottomans they had the Ashraf. And the Ashraf, they were the rulers of uh, Hijaz. They were the rulers of uh, Jeddah and Makkah and Medina and these areas. And they were loosely affiliated with the Ottomans. Like Pasha was, they were also loosely in alliance with the uh, Ottomans. And anyway, this was in the third Saudi kingdom. It was never Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah. So the Ottomans, they never had, the empire never extended to a Najd where Al Imam was. And also from the lies which are for, said against him are the famous diaries which are known as the Confessions of the British Spy or the Iraqi document by a person called Hempha or they're called the Hempha, Hempha's Diaries. And they claim that this individual, Hempha, he was a British agent and he was living in Basra in Iraq when Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, when he visited Basra to study there. And then this person writes in his diaries Na'udhu Billah, that the Imam, he was a drunkard and he used to use prostitutes, Na'udhu Billah, and he used to listen to music and other things like this. And that this individual, uh, Himfa, he influenced Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and he taught him doctrines which would lead to the uh, resolution of or the 
uh, defeat of the Ottoman Empire and the disunity of the Muslims. And, and this is a, a fabrication. Even the non-Muslim historians, they have admitted that this is, this is an absolute fabrication. Firstly, there was no individual called Hempha. He was never known. And the first person who ever made any mention of this individual was a person called Ayub Sabri Pasha from Egypt. And he wrote a five-volume book called Mir'at al haramain And he's the first person who ever made mention of Hempha. Otherwise, this person was not known. Also, they spoke about the tone in which these dyes were written. It doesn't seem to be English. And there's a historian uh, by the name of Bernard Haeckel, professor near Eastern Studies from Harvard University. And he said that it seems so the Iraqi doc document, it echoes a well-known Turkish conspiracy theory, probably fabricated by Ayub Sabri Pasha. I mean, something which he totally made up. Finally, what are some of the reasons why the movement of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab succeeded, whereas the movements of the other righteous scholars, they didn't succeed? And perhaps, in fact, the most important reason is because he started with Tawheed and he ended with a Tawheed. And this is the core principle of every single message of all of the prophets and all of the messengers. And Allah has promised that those who call to Tawheed, they will be victorious. Allah said in the Quran, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمَنْ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Those people who believe and they do not mix with their belief any type of dhulm, meaning a shirk, for them is authority and security. وَهُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ And they are the ones who will be guided. And Allah said in Surah An-Nur, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah has promised those amongst you who believe and do righteous deeds لا يستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم that Allah will give them authority upon this earth just as Allah gave authority to those who came before them ولا يمكننا لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم and Allah will make the religion which is pleased with stable and firm for them ولا يبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا and Allah will exchange their fear for security then he said يَعْبُدُونَنِي وَلَا يُشْرِكِيُونَ بِي شَيْءٍ That they should worship me alone, meaning Tawheed, and they should not ascribe partners to me. And the ayah is in Surah An-Nur, ayah number 55. Also, from the reasons why the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab succeeded was because of the help of Muhammad ibn Su'ud, rahimullah, without a doubt. So what happened is, guidance and knowledge was coming from a scholar, and force and strength was coming from an Amir. And this is the basis of every successful Muslim government. A book which guides and a sword which gives victory. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he said, Qawamuddin fi kitabin yahdi was safe in Yansur. That the establishment and the victory of the religion is through a book which guides, meaning knowledge, by the scholar. And by a sword which gives victory, meaning through al jihad fi sabilillah. And, and then he said, and Allah said, Wa kafa bi rabbika hadiyan wa nasira. Allah said, and it is sufficient for, from your Lord that He is a guide and He is one who gives victory. Look, Al Huda and Al Nasr, the book and the sword. Also, the personality of Al Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, the truthful in his niyyah. And the sincerity that he had, and the patience which he had, and the knowledge, and the character, and how he would advise everybody. He advised the public and the masses, and he advised the rulers, he advised all of them. He'd write to them. He wrote many of his books in very easy language. This is also from the reason why his da'wah was successful. If you read the majority of the his books, even a person who is beginning to learn Arabic can read the books Usul al Thalatha, Qa'id al Abba, written in very easy language. They aren't big treaties, small concise books which he wrote and he targeted the general public. In fact in some of his books he would use slang terms because people understand that colloquial type of language. In opposition to what you see from some of the du'at that on purpose they use difficult words. And somebody comes out of that lesson, wow that was such an amazing lesson. What did he get from me? It was so amazing, I didn't understand anything. This is how great his language was. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after him, Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, easy words, making nice and simple for the people. And also finally, patience. 
because every da'wah requires patience. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ yusra. إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ yusra." With every difficulty, there is ease. And with every difficulty, there is ease. And Allah said in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَبِرُوا وَصَابِرُوا وَرَابِتُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ He said, O oh people of Iman, be patient, and then be even more patient, and prepare yourselves, and have a taqwa, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So you may be successful. So in this ayah, the last ayah of Surah Ali Imran, Allah linked al-falah, success, to a sabr being patient. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا وَسَلَّمُ